Shalom. This week we are reading the second portion of the book of Breshit, Genesis, the second parsha of the Torah, Parshat Noach. Due to last week's Parshat Breshit occurring immediately after the conclusion of the holiday, time constraints prevented us from recording a lesson for Breshit. Not the first year that this has happened. So we ended up sharing no thoughts concerning the first Torah portion of the year, Parshat Breshit. I feel badly about that. And truthfully, every year regarding the transition from Breshit to Noach, I don't know about you, but personally, I feel I'm missing something. I have a hard time wrapping my mind around these massive concepts and the changes that we're going through. I didn't say the changes that we're reading about, the changes that we're going through since this is about us. All of creation, ex nihilo, the creation of this amazing world which Hashem saw was very good. And by the end of the Parsha, last week, with the passing of a mere ten generations from Adam to Noah, already such divine disappointment and regret that he decided to destroy it all with the flood? We've gone from creation to destruction, from the beginning of life to death to rebirth and restart in this week's Torah portion of Noah. Am I the only one that's dazed here? I'm asking, what does this mean for us? Because there exists, as you well know, a special relationship between the cycle of the readings of the Chumash, the five books of Moshe, the weekly Torah portions, and the fabric of our lives. The Torah readings, divinely orchestrated, are inexorably bound up with our reality. Open up your heart in the deepest way. The weekly Torah reading is an expression of our reality. Our reality is a manifestation of the weekly Torah reading. So here's the thing. Open up your heart in the deepest way again. All this is a process. After the searing and intense process that we've been going through since the summer, the months of Tammuz and Av, focusing on the destruction of the temple, followed by the high of Tuba Av, and then the months of Elul and Tishrei, the time of preparation, introspection, and repentance, the coronation of Hashem on Rosh Hashanah, and the deep recognition of His sovereignty, the realignment and complete revamping of our priorities during the ten days of repentance, the cleansing and total forgiveness of Yom Kippur, and dwelling within the presence of God in complete joy during Sukkot. After all this, we arrive at Simchat Torah, the festival of the rejoicing of the Torah itself, which here in the land of Israel is the same day as Shemini Atzeret. And then every single person in the synagogue is called up to the Torah as we conclude the reading of the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, and then on the spot, we immediately begin reading Parashat Breshit to show the continuity of the Torah, its seamlessness, how, in the words of our sages, its ending is embedded in its very beginning, how there is no ending, how the beginning is always beginning, again. All this, this process, we, hopefully, haven't simply been spectators in. We've come full circle. We are the world. Each one of us are a microcosm of the world. This program, it's all divinely activated, divinely authored, and divinely attuned to our needs. Going through this cycle, of the reading of the Torah on a yearly basis activates something within us. Finishing the cycle of Torah readings affects a tikkun, facilitates a rectification, a fixing of our souls at our very roots, puts us in touch with our own personal and individual root in the Torah, our letter, as it were, because we're taught that each soul is a letter in the Torah. And we are, we are recreated. And we start all over again with Breshit, Genesis, because now, only after having gone through what we have experienced, now we are able to start again. And as the world is recreated, we are recreated. And now it's a whole new world, and we are all new creations, and Hashem is creating the world anew with its purpose, with all its potential. And what was the reason, after all, for the purpose of creation in the first place? Greatest sages discuss this issue, and if we may state very briefly, God created the world in order, ultimately, to bestow His goodness upon man. 
and that goodness is to be shared with man in the future. And it's dependent upon man exercising his free choice in this world and choosing between right and wrong. But if the world was created for us, and we're reading the Torah portions, and it's all happening, and we're in it, and right now we're up to the flood, does this mean that we're destroying the world? Well, this might be a hint. Our sages teach us that the fate of the world was sealed on account of the rampant sins of immorality, <clears throat> sexual deviance and exploitation, selfishness, yes, that's a sin, robbery and violence. Sound familiar? You know, this time of year is referred to in Israel as after the Chagim, after the holidays. The holiday season was very busy and people put things off till after, till we get back to routine. Well, that's now. Routine is now. It's after the Chagim. And now we return to our humdrum routine. Without the highs, the exhilaration of Tishrei, we are now facing the gray days of normalcy. And of course the challenge is to find Hashem, to live with Him in the everyday, in the ordinary days of our lives. And being excited about living, which is the goal of life, is not always easy. But that's the beauty of being a person, and that is the true essence of the human experience, and the lesson deeply conveyed by Parshat Noach, as we shall see. This Shabbat is the first day of the month of Mar Cheshvan, and this month of Mar Cheshvan always begins with the reading of Noach, and in fact the waters of the great flood in the time of Noach began falling during this very month, on the 17th day of the month. The truth is that the month of Cheshvan is intrinsically associated with a downspin, with a fall. According to the mystical classical work Sefer Yitzirah, the book of formation attributed to our forefather Abraham himself, each month of the year, 12 months, is associated with a particular Hebrew letter, which dominates, which shines forth, influences the character of the month. The letter that dominates thusly in the month of Cheshvan is the letter Nun, which alludes to Nefila, which means falling. That Nun alludes to Nefila, everybody knows. The Talmud in Tractate Brachot, page 4b, asserts that for this reason the letter Nun is missing from the famed prayer known as Ashrei, Psalm 145, whose construct is based on every verse beginning with the letter of the alphabet in ascending order, but the letter Nun is skipped, because nobody wants to be reminded of falling. But what are we saying here? This month of Mar Cheshvan is pre-programmed as a downer? It's arbitrarily a time to heave a sigh and sink, nefila, into depression? I mean, I know this month seems to be a drab one compared to last month, but why should Cheshvan be a month of nefila, of falling? The simple answer would be that following the intense spiritual rush that we experienced during the spiritually fulfilling, joyous, holiday-packed month of Tishrei, which saw us ascending from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, from Yom Kippur to Sukkot, from Sukkot to Shemini Atzeret, suddenly we do sort of plummet from that progression and holiness, and we kind of spiral down back into the gray days of routine. But you know, if there's one thing that the progression of Bereshit to Noach teaches us, it's that falling is an issue. It's an issue for people. It's inevitable. It's a part of the human condition. One can't always be up. It's impossible to prevent the downward plunge occasionally. So if Tishrei was like theory, right? Perfect world. Mar Cheshvan is a return to reality of the actual world. And whenever we need to descend from a rarefied level of consciousness, ideal inspiration to actuality and the application of those ideals, it's natural that there's a descent. Case in point, the descent from the promise of Parshat Breshit to the harsh reality of Parshat Noach. Question might be, how does one survive a fall? What is the skill set required to fall successfully, to know how to fall? I didn't know, so of course I looked it up. Under the topic surviving falls, Wikipedia tells us, a falling person at low altitude will reach terminal velocity after about 12 seconds, falling some 450 meters, 1,500 feet, at that time, in that time. 
He will then maintain the speed without falling any faster. Turbine velocity at higher altitudes is greater due to the thinner atmosphere and consequent lower air resistance. Free fallers from high altitudes, including Kittinger, Baumgartner, and Ustens, discussed in this article, fell faster at higher altitudes. The severity of injury increases with the height of a free fall, but also depends on body and surface features and the manner that the body impacts on the surface." End quote. The human condition is that we can't always be up. We're bound to fall. But we need to know how to fall correctly. We may fall, but we can get up again. If we are constantly growing and each year brings us closer to our goal, we may fall, but it will be from a higher place than we were at at this time last year, because hopefully we ascend each year to a higher level. That's the cycle of completing the Torah readings every year. Wherever we land, that will always, already be higher than the place that we fell from last year, and this is indeed the cycle of our lives. In the end of last week's Torah portion, Breshit, the last eight verses state as follows. And it came to pass, when man began to increase upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of the nobles, it's actually B'nai Elohim, <coughs> the sons of the nobles saw that the daughters of man were good, and they took for themselves wives from whomever they chose. And Hashem said, my spirit shall not contend forever concerning man, since he is but flesh, and his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of the nobles would consort with the daughters of man, and they would bear for them, they are the mighty men whom from old were men of devastation. And Hashem saw that the evil of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of his heart was only evil all the time. And Hashem regretted that he had made man upon the earth, and he became grieved in his heart. And Hashem said, I will blot out man, whom I created, from upon the face of the earth, from man to cattle to creeping thing, to the fowl of the heavens, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Hashem. So who was Noah, and how do we understand him? The first verse of our portion, chapter 6, verse 9, states, Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. As opposed to those who considered themselves to be supermen, who put themselves above other men, those who called themselves B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, because they were themselves, they made themselves into gods, they were power brokers, the elites, those who took whatever they wanted for themselves, those decadent and depraved of the generation whose arrogance and desire for self-gratification ultimately destroyed the foundations of the world. As opposed to these, Noah lived as a man, and not more than that. Living like a man is no small thing. It's a full-time job. The verse says, Noah was a righteous man. He lived according to the rules that are necessary for a man to live by, for the upkeep and advancement of society and humanity. And this is precisely what made him into a perfect tzaddik, a righteous man. And this is what is meant by God walked with Noah. Noah constantly acknowledged that he felt that he needed divine aid to strengthen him, to uplift him. Now many of the commentators understand this expression, these b'nai Elohim, the sons of Elohim, which we've translated here as the sons of nobles, Many of our classic commentators understand these to be the children of rulers, of judges and officers who saw themselves as being above the law and not subject to accepted societal norms. Our sage's description of their downward moral spiral sounds chillingly familiar. The Midrash characterizes them in this manner. Demigods, they would do as they please. They expressed no thankfulness to God for the beautiful world that they lived in, but on the contrary, they mocked Him, and ultimately they denied His existence. Their society was ruled by violence and aggression, the law of the jungle. Their sexual behavior was so depraved and immoral that even the animals were influenced to cohabit outside their species. These were men who took whatever they wanted. Women were seen as nothing but objects of their pleasure, and these sons of God they permitted themselves to take whatever women they wanted, even a bride from under her bridal canopy, even a married woman. In short, their arrogance bred corruption, led to the complete breakdown of morality, and brought about the destruction of the world. 
as opposed to these people, as the Torah states, Noach was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. Noach saw himself as a man, as an ordinary person, responsible to and regulated by all the rules and boundaries that the real God made for human beings. He prayed to Hashem constantly for heavenly aid and help not to fall. This recognition, modesty, and humility are what aided him and assisted him in becoming a tzaddik, a righteous man, perfect in his generation. Flashback to us. Let's not destroy the world. It's only natural and beautifully human to fall. And in our descent from our excitement and sanctification of the days of the festival, if we learn to acknowledge and appreciate our limitations, to recognize our own weaknesses and to establish boundaries for ourselves, we can fall properly. Good intentions, though, are not enough. <clears throat> we need a plan. And that is precisely our task during this important and pivotal time, the month of Cheshvan, now upon us. Now is the time to prove whether we actually grew spiritually during the time of the Chagim. Now is the time to actualize all the resolutions and prayers of the holiday season. We may fall, but if we look to Hashem for support, we'll rise even higher. Whatever plan of action we can establish for ourselves and put into motion in this month of Cheshvan will continue for the entire year. Like Noah, acknowledging that we are people who need divine aid, who live by boundaries and rules, is what will bring us to righteousness and ultimately save the world. We are the world, each of us. We are this world. All the potential for creation, destruction, and recreation, it's all within each and every one of us.